we used to believe flow was sort of a binary state, like you're either in the zone or you're out of the zone. It worked like a light switch. And we now believe, we now know it's a four stage cycle and you have to move through the whole cycle before you can re-enter flow. So sometimes you'll hear people talk about, hey, I can be in a permanent state of flow. They don't know what they're talking about. It's not actually possible because of the nature of the cycle. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again. Great things. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. Stephen, your book, Small Furry Prayer, was a Wall Street bestseller, SF Chronicle bestseller, Angle for Quickest Flight was an SF Chronicle bestseller, it won the William Crawford Fantasy Award, your book Abundance hit Barnes & Noble bestseller, New York Times bestseller for seven weeks, you've written for Forbes, you write for Psychology Today, where does this come from? I mean, how, did, how do you get this talent to write these bestseller after bestseller? That's an interesting question. Um, I work really, really hard, I, I think is the honest answer. Um, that's a really, uh, I don't actually uh, have any idea. Um, I, I will tell you a funny story though, that uh, may put it in context. Uh, I, when I started out writing, I started out as a novelist in my first book, The Angle Quickest Reply, which you just referenced, was a novel. And I think it, it was a bestseller. It was also a fairly, uh, mediocre novel, mm -hmm. um, I think. And uh, along the way, you know, I, I started out as a journalist, so I wrote for everybody you could possibly imagine. Um, I think it's over 100, 150 publications at this point. And I discovered I had this innate talent for communicating really, really, really good ideas, really complicated ideas to people very, very easily. People could understand them. You have to understand that this was not a superpower I wanted. When I started out as a novelist, I wanted to be David Foster Wallace or Thomas Pynchon. I wanted to be this guy who was really, really famous for being able to do super complicated, fancy things with language. And my superpower was almost the exact opposite of that. So I, I think at a certain point I gave in um, and uh, decided that I would be more use to myself and to the rest of the world if I if I if I went in this route rather than the other route, which I think is is funny on a certain level, and I also think it's um, it's fairly indicative of creative careers and how um, how sharp right turns show up fairly frequently, and you you just got to go with it. When you say that you you work hard, I mean, what does that what does that mean exactly? You immerse yourself in what you're yeah. doing. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand that I get up every day at about four in the morning and, you know, I will, it's not unusual for me to write from four in the morning till five o'clock at night, six o'clock at night. Mm. Um, and to do that, and I can, I have the ability to do this over and over and over and over and over and over again, um, pretty much ad nauseum. Um, I, you know, I, I, I am lucky enough to get to do exactly what I love for a living and, I never forget the fact, and I, you know, I always, I, I tell this to other people, but, you know, kind of coming up as a journalist, I, I, I always knew every time I pitched a story to a magazine, for example, and I did a story for Time or, or, or GQ or something like that, when they said yes to me, they were saying no to 500 other people mm, who yeah. were just behind me, who were almost, you know, probably, you know, some of them are probably more talented than I, as I was, and I just had a slightly better Rolodex. But I, I was, ne I was always aware of the fact that like, there were, there were a lot of people chasing me. 
And I, I sort of never forgot that. And I kind of always assumed that I wasn't the most talented guy in the room. I, um, and so I just assumed that if I you know, wanted to keep doing what I was doing for a living, which was really the only thing I knew how to do, um, I, had to, I had to outwork everybody. So, I mean, was it important for you to stay on the sort of razor's edge of your research and writing and keeping up with things? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, my friend Andrew Hessel <laughs> uh, likes to tell me that he thinks I'm five to 20 years ahead of most people, and I have to remember that when I'm writing. Um, and, and, and what I think what he means is that, like, my, you know, and as you can see from Tomorrowland, um, I, my interest has always been, you know, sort of what's going on on the cutting edge of the cutting edge. And I often, I don't actually even know what's going on any other place is, pr is probably a better way of saying that. I'm just naturally <laughs> att attracted to those things. I have no idea at the time that I'm actually on the cutting edge of stuff. I'm just, you know, following my interests where they lead. But one of the things I will tell you, and I learned this a very long time ago, as a journalist, when I was finishing a story, you know, my stories were always about the person or, or individuals doing something kind of astounding and amazing and, you know, very, very extreme in the world. And the last question I would ever ask people is, okay, what's the strangest, most interesting thing you know of that's going on in the world right now? And oftentimes that was where I went next. So I wasn't even driving the bus. I was just getting advice from really smart people. Would you say that you have had a sense of the long term, I mean, you said that your your friend said that you were you know five ten years ahead of everyone. But do you, do you yourself feel like you see the long game in Tomorrowland? You're, I mean, there's so many examples of in here about how much we are evolving as a species and how quickly that evolution is happening. What I'm asking is, what is the end goal? I mean, what is the end goal for you? Well. That's a tricky question. Um, and, you know, I, a lot of my work has been focused around people pushing past the kind of supposed limits of human performance. And whether it's, you know, kinesthetic physical performance where I'm looking in Rise of Superman at action, adventure, sports athletes who are literally doing the quote unquote impossible over and over and over again and trying to figure out where that's coming from and why that's happening. Or in Tomorrowland, which where I, you know, spent time with, you know, 20 or so different individuals who all invented the future, you know, and, and, and brought it in. So I'm, I'm interested in what does it take to dream up a world that other people don't think it's possible? And what does it take to make that possible? And I'm interested in making that available to kind of everybody. I, that's the, the one thing that I've, you know, learned along the way. Uh, and, and, and I don't remember who first said it to me, but way, way, way back when in my career, and it was with one of these, I'm inventing the future kind of people, they pointed out to me that it takes exactly the same amount of energy as it does to open a local dry cleaning establishment and really succeed with that as it does to change the world. The work required is gonna be the same. The vision is the only thing that's different. And I have found that to be very, very true hmm. along the way. Uh, I don't, th I, hard work is hard work is hard work. There's only 24 hours in a day. There's only so hard people can actually work. The size of the vision is is what tends to be different. And I think the only reason the size of the vision tends to be different or a lot of the reason has to do with the people around you. You tend to believe what's possible. What the people around you believe is possible. For example, when I spent uh, a lot of my nine, the 90s in Squaw Valley, uh, California, where, uh, you know, action adventure sport athletes were literally redefining almost on a daily basis what was possible. And from the outside, it looked like the most revolutionary thing in the history of the world. But from the inside, it looked like a bunch of friends who were going out onto the mountain and pushing each other and having a good time. Mm -hmm. S Silicon Valley looked the same way. I was in San Francisco at the beginning of, the, of kind of the internet and got to work uh, on BuzzNet, which was the very first online magazine. Um, and, you know, it, you know, on the outside, it looked like a revolution and on the inside, it looked like a bunch of people, you know, sharing passion and having fun. I don't think there's a huge difference other than the size of the vision. 
feels like it's so important. Yes, hard work is hard work, as well as if you are inventing something that is going to change the world, is doesn't that change your, you know, everything? I mean, shouldn't that change the the whole game plan for you? I don't, you know, it should. I'll give you a, a different example. You know, my writing partner on Bold and Abundance is Peter Diamandis, and Peter's you know, one of the co-founders of Singularity University, where every summer they get together, you know, graduate students, and they challenge them in 10 weeks. At, you know, they put them through some coursework and, and, and whatnot and train people up in, in, in exponentially accelerated technologies and how they work and how to harness them. But they charge them with founding a business that can impact the lives of a billion people in 10 years or yet or less. And that's, I mean, that's their summer program. That's what these people do. And more and more, I mean, maybe it, it was not always this way. Maybe I'm giving you a view that is very, very colored by the technology of our time. I was talking to uh, the venture capitalist Bill Tai earlier today, and he reminded me once again that, you know, when he started, when he got into this business, in, into the business, it cost, you know, $5 million to start a company. And today it costs about $5,000. And you know, we, are, we, we have an enormous technological advantage, and maybe I am just speaking from behind that advantage. But at this point today, with the, with the power of technology, I really do think it's just a question of how big is your, is, is your dream. That was actually going to be my next question is, do you, do you think that our generation today, because of technology, because of computers, because of the access that we have to the internet and information, do you think that is the reason that more people are kind of striving to, quote, change the world? I think it's two things. Um, I think the technology is astounding. I also think... I think there's been there's always been something very subcultural about the urge to change the world. Um, that has not that's not a, that doesn't tend to be a mainstream preoccupation so much. It tends to be much more subcultural. But for the very first time in history, um, subculture right now, counterculture, rather than being punk rockers or misfits or whatever, it's entrepreneurs. That's mm. as far as I can tell the the newest subculture. And I don't know how long it's going to last. But for right now, that's what you see. And, and, and it's blending, right? You go to Burning Man and you see Silicon Valley. And you go to Silicon Valley and you see Burning Man. It's one and sort of the same thing in a, in a weird way today. That, that hasn't happened. But there's a lot of, you know, kind of punk rock energy in subculture in saying, hey, I can do what the other person can't. And it just so happens that now because of technology, that's aligned, you know, that's aligned people in a way that hasn't before. I also think the millennials have a different set of values, the very, very, very different set of values. And they, more than any other generation in the past, measure themselves by the size of the impact they can have in the world. And that's a critical difference. I think it's also a good time for I me. Mean, you know, when I came up in, you know, when I got out of college and in, in, uh, in, it was in the eighties and in the 80s, if you walked into a boardroom and you started talking about passion or purpose or creativity even or inspiration, I mean, you would be laughed out of that boardroom. You would have been run out of that boardroom. Forget about talking about something like flow and altered states of consciousness, what I do for a living, right? Just even kind of the entrance points topics into that. And uh, let me put it a different way. And this is something most people don't know, but it's shocking. So in science, until the 1990s, emotions, internal subjective experience was not even a, a topic we took seriously. It wasn't until the 90s when a man named Jacques Pancep sort of traced the um, neuron by neuron chain of uh, six primary emotions in all mammals in rats when he, when he discovered this, the scientists went, oh, wow, I think emotions are a real thing and maybe we should study them. And that sounds totally absurd, but it was really what was going on. So you're, you've got a world where, you know, passion and purpose, you know, are not things that show up in business and emotions are not real to scientists. And yet 20 years later, here we are. And the most, you know, go, go to HBR, go to the Harvard Business Review and search passion or purpose or creativity or inspiration or any of these, you know, soft topics that science didn't even say was were real until the turn of the century. And they're now the center of the conversation. Hmm. So 
you know, and that's a, that's a, and because of that, by the way, I think entrepreneurs have been, you know, sort of afforded this ability to be the new subculture. I, you know, these are, these are haphazard guesses, by the way, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination, a cultural critic, mm -hmm. um, but why do you think being an entrepreneur is so, I mean, don't you think this, the industry is completely saturated with people who are kind of overextending their reach in a way? I mean, I feel like, I feel like if I hear about another guy that has invented a billion dollar company, I'm going to scream. I agree. I, I work pretty hard and I would like to think I'm having some impact on the world through my work. So, I mean, how do you feel about the state of entrepreneurship and that everyone wants to start their own company now? You know, I'm less concerned. I, I mean, I'm, ex I'm excited by the fact that everybody wants to start their own company. I think that's interesting. I, um, yes, I am as, you know, sick as you are of hearing about it. What, what bothers me about some of the entrepreneurship stuff is the sort of the model it's being built under. I think it's very, I think a lot of it is very short sighted right now. People want three years to, you know, a billion customers kind of stuff. That kind of thinking to me is kind of disastrous. I'm much more interested in so-called mid-market companies. First mm -hmm. of all, they're the bread and butter backbone of, you know, of our economy. And second of all, it, you know, I don't, when somebody tells me they want to start a billion dollar company, 90% of the time, I think they want to make the next angry frogs or something like that. Cause that's the only way you scale up that big, that fast, um, most of the time. So I think some of it is, I, you know, I wish their visions were bigger. Um, I wish the market supported a kind of a longer term vision of possibility. I wish at a, at a systems level it was more integrated, but you know, it, to me, the fact that there's this much, you know, if anything is going to save the human race from itself, it's creativity. And this many people saying, hey, I've got an idea and the world is such that I can now go out and try to make that happen. Do I think that's a better world than everybody getting out uh, and trying to go get a job on Wall Street or, you know, or that model? Yeah, I like I'm much more interested than the let's invent shit together model <laughs> than the old model. I really I really am. So, you know, yes, I, 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 there are a million things wrong with it. But I will also say we've never seen anything like this in history. And of course, there are a million things wrong with it. Right. The fundamental model in Silicon Valley and all this stuff has always been fail forward, fail faster. And so, of course, there's a lot of things that you could point at and say, yeah, this isn't this this is not working. This is not working. This is not working. And then you got to stop and go. Okay, this entire model didn't really exist until 2004, 2005, right? So you're talking about something that is a decade, 11 years old. This much creativity being thrust into the system. Hmm. Um, I, you know, it's amazing to me that the system is supporting it as much as it is. I mean, with the rise of super the. The Rise of Superman, did you find that you were kind of addressing a lot of entrepreneurs and startup people with this book just because it was talking about how to reach flow state and how to be in the zone or the forever box? Yeah, so it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a funny answer. Uh, when we, when I, you know, I had been working on flow, right? The, the, the zone, the, the, the state of, you know, flow is technically defined as a state of an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. Mm -hmm. And we had been looking at it primarily in artists, athletes, and academics. Those were the, those were the tribes where <clears throat> we, we were seeing, we thought the most flow was, and that was generally what most people thought and i'll tell you something really funny so if you go to our website the website for the flow genome project um you'll find a on the on the landing page um you'll find a free flow diagnostic it's a flow profile it's technically a traitology it says if you're this kind of person you're likely to find the most flow in your life by going in these directions hmm. it's sort of a roadmap on where to look for more flow in your life and it's you know it's based on the fact that flow has a lot of kind of it's got based 18 different triggers that we know of and different people are more susceptible to different triggers right. so this just tells you where to look um and what's interesting is it has now been taken 
by over 30,000 people. So it is, I think, as far as we as far as we know, the largest study ever done in optimal psychology, optimal performance. Right. And we went in when when this went up and we were really sure we were going to see more of what we expected, more artists, more athletes. Instead, out of our study our, of our study subjects, 48% of them find the most flow in their lives doing knowledge work, being creative on the job, being an engineer, being an entrepreneur, being a doctor, being a lawyer, take your pick. So what we we went in really thinking that this was something for really kind of elite high performing teams. Mm-hmm. And we came out going, holy crap. It's I mean, we knew flow was ubiquitous. We know it shows up in anyone anywhere provided certain initial conditions were met. We've known mm-hmm. that for a lot of years. Mm-hmm. But to find out that it's actually showing up most in knowledge work, uh, you know, was shocking to us, but it does explain, you know, interest in Rise of Superman, interest in the Flow Genome Project. Um, in the beginning, it was high-performing organizations, like you would like you would expect, um, of uh, you know, athletes or or U.S. Special Forces, that kind of stuff. But now we spend as much time on Wall Street and Main Street Street as we do almost any place else. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you you talk about flow as being a sort of spectrum experience. There's a macro and there's a micro. You can enter these small states of flow and then you have larger states of flow. Am I am I on the right track here? You're totally on the right track. It's like, well, it, it's it's just think about any emotion, right? Every emotion we have, every internal experience we have is a spectrum. Anger. You can be a little bit irked or you can be homicidally murderous. It's the same, you know, emotion at the at the base. So you can, flow has 10, well, actually seven defining characteristics. Wait, some of them are, are very fancy. Your sense of self disappears. Time passes strangely. It'll slow down or it'll speed up. Uh, but there's also, you know, simple ones like uninterrupted concentration, a sense of control over what you're doing. Anyways, you can be in a state of microflow where a couple of these things show up and it, you know, that, 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 for example, you fall into a great conversation at work with your coworker and an hour goes by and you don't even notice it and you're so lost in the ideas that your, your sense of self is sort of turned off. You haven't really been thinking about, you know, what you have to make for dinner, the work you're not getting in and you're so sucked into the conversation. Or you can have a state of macro flow where all 10 show up. And until the 1950s, we thought uh, – that you Mac, we talked about macro flow as a mystical experience. We didn't actually, you didn't, you, it was not even, you know, it was, it was such a profoundly altered state that we had terms like mystical experience. It wasn't until a psychologist named Abraham Maslow discovered flow in this huge study group packed with atheists that it even went, holy crap, this isn't a spiritual experience. I guess other people have this as well. How important is the creative process and, and actually it being inside of creative creating something. I mean, you said that doctors can do this, lawyers can do this. Is there a s- certain part of the r- range of the the brain that is specifically engaged while we are entering a flow state? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, and so when I talk about flow, I am literally talking about three neurobiological processes. When somebody is in flow, their brain. So, so let, let, let me back up and say, normally under normal conditions right now, for example, you and I are in conversation. And if I were to look inside your brain, what I'd see is a lot of activity in your prefrontal cortex, the kind of latest, newest part of your brain, where you do a lot of complex decision making and long term planning and things along those sorts. And I, your brain waves would be in the high beta range, which is where we are when we're thinking and conversing and whatnot. And Mm -hmm. neurochemically, we'd see sort of standard attention and stress hormones. So we'd see cortisol, norepinephrine, and adrenaline probably. That's sort of 21st century normal. When we move into flow, everything changes. The prefrontal cortex starts to deactivate. So it turns off this area that's hyperactive right now. It starts to shut off. Your brain waves move from you know, agitated beta down towards calmer alpha and meditative theta. And the stress hormones get flushed out of your system and they're replaced by feel good performance enhancing neurochemicals like dopamine, serotonin and anandamide and endorphins and such. So there's a there's when I'm speaking about flow, I'm talking about a very specific shift 
in neurobiology that accompany those seven phenomenological characteristics I talked about earlier. Phenomenological is just a fancy way of saying this is how these things make, this is how this experience makes me feel. So this takes away the 10% of our brain myth, right? Yeah, so the, it, it's, a, it's, a funny, it's a funny thing, and it's actually one of the things that's kind of steered a lot of this research sideways for a long time. But way back at the turn of the century, a psychologist, a Harvard psychologist named William James made a speech. What he said was misinterpreted, and it became what you referenced, the 10% brain myth, the idea that, hey, I'm only using 10% of my brain at any one time, so ultimate performance, a.k.a. flow, must be my full brain on overdrive. And it turns out uh, we had it exactly backwards. When we achieve states of ultimate performance, our brain doesn't become hyperactive. It becomes hypoactive, H-Y-P-O. Wow. It's the opposite. It starts to deactivate. It wow. shuts down. So, you know, another way of putting this is, you know, we, we've, we've all heard Huxley's famous phrase, you fling open the doors of perception. <laughs> yeah. Well, it turns out, actually, no, they're shutting down on a certain, wow. on a certain level. It's, we're going in the opposite direction. What's really happening is you're trading conscious processing which is very, very potent, but it's also very, very slow, very, very energy expensive, um, and very, very limited in terms of its RAM. The number of things that the brain can consciously process at once is really small. Consciously, you, you have something called working memory, and the maximum it can hold on to at once is about nine items, but most <laughs> of us tap out around four. So working memory is really, really small, very, very limited, powerful, but small. When we hmm. swip over to the subconscious, you're in much, much faster, two, two to 5,000 times faster than conscious thought, extremely energy efficient, and unlimited RAM. We literally don't have any idea what the carrying capacity, the storage capacity of the subconscious actually is at this point. So, so you know, researchers refer to it as essentially infinite because we can't come close to finding a limit. This is shocking to me. I'm blown away. I, so you're saying that the brain actually is shutting down the, the regions that make you kind of think of yourself as yeah, unable me, to do something. Let me give you a, let me, let, let's put it in more concrete terms. So when you move into flow, you experience transient hypofrontality, transient meaning temporary, hypo, right, we just talked about it's the opposite of hyper, it means to slow down, and frontality refers to the prefrontal cortex, that latest, greatest part of your brain. So why does your sense of self and self-consciousness and that inner critic, that nagging defeatist always on voice in your head that won't go away, shut down and flow? Why does this happen? Because self is actually calculated by a bunch of different structures in the brain that are all found in the prefrontal cortex. So as parts of it start to shut out, shut down, you can no longer perform this calculation. That's the same thing. Why does time pass so strangely in flow? We've all had the experience of you know, getting into that great conversation and an hour goes by and you think it was two minutes. Why does that happen? Because when you go into that conversation, you're, the focus that is required, what you're really looking at, by the way, is an efficiency exchange. Mm -hmm. The brain has a fixed energy budget. So when you're putting all your energy into focus and attention and being right here, right now in the present moment, mm -hmm. The brain deactivates non-critical structures to save energy and be able to give you more energy for focus and attention. It's beautiful. So when that happens, the prefrontal cortex starts to shut down. That's where your sense of time goes. Time is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. As parts of it wink out, we can't separate past from present from future, and we're plunged into a state that uh, people will talk to. Philip Zimbardo at Stanford calls the elongated now or the deep now. So I mean, I mean, would you relate this back to how how long does this do you, does the research go back on on this flow state? I mean, is this a survival mechanism? Is this something that was sort of programmed into us to defend off against sort of big wild animals? Or well, so it, so two questions there. It is different. You're taught the survival mechanism is the fight or flight response. Right. That is different than flow. Very very different. In fight or flight, you get adrenaline, norepinephrine, a little bit of dopamine, and cortisol. It's a huge, huge, huge response, um, but it's a very, very limited response. When you're in fight or flight, you have three options. You can flee, you can fight, or you can freeze. That's all the possibilities. When you're in flow, 
it's the exact opposite. It's options wide open. Almost anything you do, you're going to be excellent at. So you can really do whatever is in front of you. It's, it's, it's the actual opposite end of the spectrum. They're exact opposite responses, though they share similar neurobiology. That said, the research for flow goes all the way back to the 18. 70s basically so or 1880s so there's there's like 125 years of flow science and part of it was the discovery of the fight or flight response people had started to realize that certain high risk situations seemed to provoke unbelievable responses and they didn't you know at the time they didn't know it was one thing they they would look and they go pupils dilate and blood pressure goes up and you know all these different physiological responses happen and then a man named walter bradford cannon came along and discovered they were actually the same thing it was actually one thing it was the fight or flight response hmm. um, so it was that was a very big discovery along along the way it was the that when that was discovered it was the very first time performance enhancement was seen as neurobiological. And it was a big shift, right? Before that, if you wanted a better time in the 100-yard bash, you prayed to Hermes. You wanted to write a better sonnet, you talked to the muses. But after Walter Bradford Ken came along, it turned a gift to the gods into a byproduct of standard biology. And that was cool, because <laughs> biology was hackable, right? We could do something yeah. um, about it. We didn't just have to, have to sacrifice our children to the gods in the hope that we might be more creative and start up a new company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. Thankful for that. Um, so, I mean, you talk about a sort of baseline that comes from a struggle, when you're when you're reaching when you're moving through a sort of flow cycle, the the base that the start of that cycle is a struggle, right? Yeah, we we used to believe flow was sort of a binary state, like you're either in the zone or you're out of the zone. It worked like a light switch, and we now believe we now know it's a four stage cycle, and you have to move through the whole cycle before you can re-enter flow. So sometimes you'll hear people talk about, hey, I can be in a permanent state of flow. They don't know what they're talking about. It's not actually possible because of the nature of the cycle. And the first stage of that cycle is a, is a struggle phase. It's a loading phase. Flow is what happens when the brain can start to automatize processes and automatize things. And But before that can happen, you have to feed it a ton of information a ton of data so this is skill acquisition you know if you're if you're a baseball player this is just like literally learning to keep your eye on the ball if you're a writer this could be you know the research phase where you're talking to lots of people and having lots of conversations and making notes but you have no idea what you're doing and the interesting thing about struggle is in flow the prefrontal cortex is turned off. In struggle, it's hyperactive. And because it's hyperactive, and because it's so limited in things that it can actually hold on to and think about, you are going to bypass its processing limits pretty quickly, and you're gonna get frustrated. And what's interesting about what we're learning about ultimate human performance is a lot of your emotions, when you're talking about ultimate human performance, don't mean what you think they mean. They almost mean the exact opposite. And you sort of have to unlearn really long-term kind of emotional, emotional decisions. And for example, in struggle, frustration, which is a constant companion in struggle, is a sign that you are moving in the right direction and you should keep going. In every other walk in life, struggle is a sign that you're screwing up, you should back off, you should stop, this isn't working, you're frustrated, right? Hmm. In when, when you're actually in struggle and moving towards flow, it's a sign that you're moving in the right direction. Hmm. And then there's, there's a, a, a release, right? The second stage of the cycle happens as, so, so we wanna trade conscious processing for subconscious processing. How do you do that? You have to stop thinking about what you've been thinking about. You have to sort of, take take your mitts off of it so the subconscious can take over and there's a this is to move from struggle into release for this to happen the research shows that you need you need a distraction essentially and what really works best is low grade physical activity going for a long walk albert einstein liked to row or rowboat out into the middle of lake geneva and stare at the clouds and tv uh, kills this right yeah because of because tv shifts your brain waves in a very peculiar way that will actually block you from going into flow i also think reading can work really really well but reading 
really kind of like fast paced, popular nonfiction thrillers, spy novels, that kind of stuff doesn't seem to work as well either. And it, I'm not exactly certain why, and uh, certainly more research needs to be done on this, but th those are the only two things that tend, tend to not work. Gardening works really, really well. Building model airplanes works really, really re well. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different different ways to go into it, but it will move you, you know, into release. Once your brain can stop thinking about the problem, it can get automatized, and once that's kind of the solution emerges, basically, that is what kicks you over into flow, which is the third state of the cycle. And on the back end, there's a recovery phase. Um, there's a, what go, flow is a very, very big high. It's extremely pleasurable, but it's followed by a deep low. And you have to know that's coming. It's very distressing for a lot of people. They don't know it's coming. They're, you know, they no longer feel like Superman. They feel very, very mortal. There's biological reasons for this. The, the feel-good neurochemistry that underpins the state, those, are, those chemicals are in limited supply. And once they burn out, they take a little while to replenish. They take nutrition and sunlight and vitamins and minerals. And it takes a little while. And that, you know, that down is actually a really, it's sort of a built-in, it has a built-in recovery period that if you take advantage of, will really, really work to your benefit. And if you fight against, is really going to destroy you because it will lock you out of just emotionally think about it this way if you're really if you're no longer in flow you don't feel like superman the ideas have stopped flowing it's de it's depressing it's whatever you're supposed to be sleeping and resting and relaxing and that sort of stuff but if you get gripped that you're no longer in flow if you start freaking out about it which is fairly common you have to move from there into struggle the next phase in the cycle is struggle and if you're not recovering and instead are, you know, are, are gripped in this, in this struggle phase, it's, or in this, it's in, excuse me, in the recovery phase, it's going to be very hard to move into struggle, which is what comes next. Right. You go back into struggle. And you see that a lot, by the way, with, with, with entrepreneurs, with high performers. High performers don't like to shut it down. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I'll tell you something. In Rise of Superman, where I really look at action and adventure sport athletes who are, you know, and we, and the reason I do is they've gotten better at harnessing flow than pretty much any other population on earth. Um, one of the reasons is a lot of those sports are weather dependent. So they come with built in recovery periods, big right. storm blows in, everybody goes surfing, everybody goes skiing and it lasts for a couple of days and then it goes away and there's a, there's a break before the next storm cycle. And so everybody, they've already been out there, they've been risking their lives, chasing, chasing whatever. And, you know, then there's, there's a dip. So they use that, they really take advantage of the recovery phase, it comes built in. Most, you know, high performing lives don't actually come with built in recovery phases. And, you know, even earlier, you know, when we started this conversation, I talked about, you know, I work very, very hard and I do, but I also play very, very hard and I also recover very, very hard. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's important. Let's. How How do you do that? How do you play? Well, I for me, I I you know I like to hurl myself down mountains at high speeds, as a general rule. So I don't care if it's mountain bikes or skis or whatever. Take your pick. But that's you know I try to get into big nature and you know do something, you know, fun at least a couple times a week. That so I so I have those kind of you know big big blocks built in. Um, every day, you know, I'll hike my dogs through the mountains for about an hour in the morning. Um, I'll take a, a break and, you know, do some kind of workout in the afternoon for another hour, you know, as, as part of, you know, as part of, as part of that stuff. And, you know, I take, I just spent, uh, April in Squaw Valley. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I was finishing a book, but I was doing nothing else. I was skiing and I was, uh, writing and skiing and writing and nothing else. I mean, this sounds like the best thing ever. You can work on the thing that you're most passionate about, go through the struggle phase and then go play. I mean, this is how this is what we should have been taught in school on how to learn things. Well, that's I mean, I, I've I've said that for, for a while. I don't know. I, I was not very good at school. I um, and I was I, there are a lot of different reasons for for it. But one of them was that. I'm a macroscopic learner, and school is built for microscopic learners. It goes from small ideas to bigger ideas to biggest ideas. And I learn exactly backwards. I need the biggest idea first, and you know, and then then I can sort of get to the smaller idea. And when I figured that out, 
it was, I mean, it was the most ridiculous thing in the world. It was like, well, what else can't I learn at that point? I figured out how my brain learns and then I could learn anything. And God, I wish somebody would have taught me that when I was younger. I wish somebody would have taught me that frustration is a sign that I'm moving in the right direction when I was younger. Yeah. You know, I wish somebody would have sat me down and said, hey, learning is invisible and you're going to be terrible at it up until the moment that you're good at it. And that's just how it works. And so you, all those really basic, here's how your brain works. Here's how you learn. Here's how you hack the system. Oh, my God. It would have been so freaking helpful to me. Yeah, that's why I loved your book so much is because it just it helped me understand my own process just because I feel like I kind of push myself to that sort of brink of madness of working on something until I right before I go insane. And but the hardest the hardest thing that I think is for me is just kind of stepping back, stepping away from it. I always say that when you're so frustrated, you're punching the floor. The hardest thing to remember is that you should stop. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I mean, that's there's a reason for that. So if you look at your brain when you're in that state, you're not going to look any different than somebody with OCD. It's a very tight cluster of neurons, and your thoughts are sort of going in a tight circle. And until you relax, you're never going to break out of that circle. So there's no – once you're at that point – you are not your brain. Your neurobiology is going to lock you out. You cannot work through that spot. The brain doesn't work that way. It, you'll never find the good idea because you're too, there's too much. The more norepinephrine, the more anxiety you're feeling, the f less wide the database searched by the pattern recognition system. So the extreme example we talked about earlier is fight or flight, where your options are limited to three. But being really stressed out, your options are limited to 15 hmm. and you've already exhausted all 15 possibilities and you're just going in circles. Mm -hmm. You literally like you, there's no, you can't fight that. That's basic underlying neurobiology. It's how the system works. You can only work with it. And the only thing to do is to walk away. Now I will tell you, I'll give you a, a, a tip that, that, that has worked for me. Um, and, it, and has worked for other people I know when, because, when you're in that state, your brain is doing a very tight loop and it's not looking for new ideas, you are not going to remember what to do right. Your brain can literally not find the idea. So I keep a folder on my computer or, or, or a Word document that says shit to do when stuff goes wrong. And for example, like when I'm writing badly, for example, it's usually one of three things. <laughs> And so I have a list of when you're writing badly, it's usually one of these three things. <laughs> so take a break so your brain can calm down and then try these three things. It'll probably solve your problem. I love that. What, are the, what are the like three you things? Have, you, leave, you leave clues for yourself because the more stressed out you, you are, the less creative your brain is able to be. And the, it's not going to find the solutions, even the ones that you <laughs> know work. The Greeks have this great word, anemnesis, uh, which is the forgetting of the forgetting. It's, the, it's not just that you've forgotten something. It's that you've forgotten that you've forgotten it. <laughs> yeah. And so there's, there's the opposite of it, which when you remember what you've, you know, it's the remembering of what you've <laughs> forgotten to remember. Um, and we all know this experience. We have this experience. You're like, oh, crap, I knew that all along. Why didn't I see that? <laughs> right? um, I, what I've done is I've said, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I, I don't know why I didn't see that. I, maybe I, you know, I'm not smart enough or the neurobiology works this way, but I exported it into an outside list um, that works really, really, really well. By the way, Peter uh, Diamandis in bold, we, Peter has a bunch of laws, calls them Peter's laws that he's lived by his whole life. That's the exact same thing. He's externalized his database of what to do when things are going wrong. So if you don't mind me asking, I mean, what is on your three list? What, what, is, what are the three things that you kind of have to rem remind yourself of? Well, so what I look for is, is my writing arrogant, boring, or confusing? Those are the signs. When my writing is one of those things, you know, I'm, I'm, that's the feedback I'm looking for. Um, Usually when my writing is arrogant, um, I'm using fancy language to cover for the fact that I haven't done enough research and I don't know enough about what's going on. That's what happens. When my writing is confusing, I don't know my starts or my endings. 
Hmm. I haven't figured out where the story starts and I haven't figured out where it goes. So I'm wandering all over the frickin' place. Um, and when my writing is boring, it usually means I haven't discovered the right tone for the book, the hmm. right story, the, the article, right? The right style. My style is wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are, you know, that's a lot of years of experience um, and knowing myself as a writer and, and what, and by the way, I have uh, I, a feedback is a flow trigger. And uh, I said earlier that flow follows focus. It can only happen when all of our attention is, is, is in the present moment. And one of the most common flow triggers is, is known as immediate feedback. And the reason is it's not for any big fancy way, but it allows you to course correct without breaking state. So if I know where I am and I know where I need to go next, I don't have to stop and think about it. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to pull my attention out of what I'm doing. So one of the things that we teach people at the Flow Genome Project is to tighten feedback loops. And I do this in my own writing because writing, by the way, you know, I could work, if I'm working on a book, I, my editor is going to see that book, if I'm lucky, once every three months. That is not the kind of feedback that produces great writing. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a guy on my staff whose job it is to read everything I write and tell me first and foremost, is it boring, arrogant, or confusing? So, you know, not only have I externalized, you know, the, my what to do when shit goes wrong list, I also have added a feedback layer into my life. And I, I tell people that what, like the, the way to do this is I call it the minimal feedback for flow. For me, the minimal feedback I need for flow is, is it boring, arrogant, or confusing, right? Everybody in their primary activity knows, you know, if they've been doing it at any, at any length and if they're successful, they know what errors look like, right? They know yeah. what boring, arrogant, or confusing is for them. And literally, if you can't, you know, I am lucky enough these days that I can actually pay somebody to do this. But before I could pay somebody, I had a buddy. He figured out what his minimal feedback for flow was. I had mine and we traded. Yeah. Right. Like anybody can go on the buddy system with this. You can do it in an office, on your own, whatever, take your pick. But it will massively increase the amount of flow you're getting in your life. OK, so Tomorrowland, you know, I, I took, took four days. I got your books on Monday and today's Friday, so I had four days to absorb two of your books. And I mean, Tomorrowland, you go in and you sort of you start with this amputee. You tell this sort of parallel story between this amputee and remind me again who the other person yeah, was. So it's the story of you, Hare, who is the inventor of the world's first bionic body part, the inventor of the first bionic ankle, and Major David Roselle, who was the very first person outfitted with one. So it's the, it's, and they both are amputees. You hair lost both of his legs below the knee, um, his ankles basically, in a uh, mountaineering accident. Yeah. And uh, Major David Roselle ran over a roadside bomb in Iraq and yeah. lost his leg that way. And uh, yeah, I, we I tell the stories in parallel, also because you know, individually, each of them are, are sort of the most amazing people you'd ever meet on the planet. <laughs> One just alone and together, like there were, you couldn't pick. I couldn't like as a, as a, as a journalist, there was no, you Hare's story. The man who invented the world's first bionic ankle is really one of the most astounding stories ever. And major David Roselle you know, the first guy to return to combat with a bionic limb, you know, he's, it, it's, it, it, he's, he's just as astounding. Um, so I was fortunate enough to, you know, get to spend time with both of them. But you also, you get it, you start to talk about how much we are advancing, how quickly and how uh, Moore's law is kind of being exponentiated and it's moving faster. This part of our civilization, our culture is moving faster than Moore's law. So Moore's law, as you pointed out, refers to computing power. And it basically says, Hey, the, you know, computing power doubles periodically every 18 months, your computers get twice as fast for the same price. This is an exponential growth curve. And 
Moore's Law has held steady for about 60 years. It turns out that exponential growth curves, when they show up in technology, they function more like natural laws than they do like marketing predictions. Moore's Law has held steady through world wars and economic depressions and, you know, take your pick, plagues and, and, and earthquakes and floods and fires, and it keeps going. And what Ray Kurzweil, head of engineering at Google, discovered is that once a technology becomes an information technology, meaning once you can program it in the ones and zeros of computer code, it jumps on the back of Moore's Law. So biotechnology, which is where bionics sits, is currently accelerating at five times the speed of Moore's Law. It's literally doubling in power every four months. And so here's the craziest part about Tomorrowland, right? Uh, you hair, when I met him, this was about four or five years ago, and he had created the very first bionic human body part. Today, 50% of the human body is replaceable with bionics. That's what, that's, what, that's what exponential growth actually looks like in the real world. And that is, you know, is showing up obviously all over the place, and it's what, one of the things that is you know, really turning science fiction into science fact. And, I mean, you also get into NDEs and out-of-body experiences, and you really, I mean, it, it really looked like you did the research to, to cover these. Why did you decide to go into this sort of quasi-mystical, I mean... That research was, I mean, what you're looking at, uh, even though the article uh, the, 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 was stuff that I was working on when I was writing my second book, West of Jesus, which is about the neurobiology of spiritual experience. And it was the very first book. Remember I told you that up until the 50s, most people thought flow was a mystical experience, mm -hmm. that a lot of people still thought flow was a mystical experience. And it turns out, if you, if this, is, this, is, this is peculiar, but if you look under the hood of flow states or uh, so-called spiritual or mystical or contemplative states, so meditative states or near-death experiences or things along those lines, or even psychedelic states, so what happens when you take mescaline or LSD or something like that, it turns out the neurobiology is very, very similar. The knobs and levers being tweaked in the brain mm -hmm. are almost exactly the same. They're almost the same experience. So early, when I first started looking at flow in the late 90s, I was look. I thought I was looking for spiritual experiences, and as it turns out, the first person who gave us any insight into flow, Dr. Andrew Newberg at the University of Pennsylvania, he was actually studying mystical experiences. He was looking at what happens in the brains of Tibetan Buddhists and Franciscan nuns when they feel one with everything, right. which is the fundamental definition of a mystical experience. You feel one with everything. Well, in flow, especially in a macro flow state you also feel one with everything. And by the way, why, does, why do you feel one with everything? Transient hypofrontality. There's a part of your brain, superior right parietal lobe, that does a lot, it helps you navigate through space. So it helps you kind of not bump into the furniture. And so people who have a stroke or brain damage, this part of the brain, they can't sit down on a couch because they're not sure where their leg ends and the couch begins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it turns out, in states of extreme concentration, like meditation, when you really need a lot of energy going into your focus, this portion of your brain shuts down. It takes away your ability to differentiate self from other. So at that moment in time, when that happens, when this portion of the brain shuts down, your brain thinks it's one with everything because it can't tell the difference. Because, And by the way, we all have that boundary line around the self. You think it's, you think, oh my God, this has to be drawn by, by my skin. That's where I end, of course, how stupid. But no, we all have the experience. You play tennis and you get good at it and the racket feels like an extension of your hand or your skis feel like an extension of your hand or you drive your car and you can feel the road through your pedals, right? Race car drivers talk about that. That is because the boundary we draw around ourselves is flexible. Blind people can feel the sidewalk through the tips of their cane, right? It is a flexible boundary. And it, the reason is, is for evolutionary purposes. When mothers hold infants, infants are heavy. And if they were conscious of the fact that, oh my God, I'm holding this kid all day long, it's on my back, I'm in the field, I'm whatever, um, it would be a burden. 
So we extend the boundary of self and mothers can't tell the difference between their own body and the infant's body. It becomes one thing together. It serves a good evolutionary function. So it, this has gets sort of mapped out. And there's a, the, the, the field of, of neurobiology that studies this kind of extension is really flourishing right now. We're learning a lot of neat things. But back in the late 90s, all I knew is Flo had this experience and Andy Newberg had sort of decoded it and I got to know Andy as a result and you know it steered my research so in the early days of you know when flow science really so the psychology of flow dates back to the 1870s the neurobiology what's going on under the hood the mechanism is only 20 years old and really it, I mean there were a, a couple other earlier experiments that were done but Andy Newberg was the first time we got a really good picture of holy crap this is what's going on this is what's causing this incredibly weird sensation and what's what's interesting about about that and, and why like I, I talk about the science transformation of science fiction into science fact and the impact it's going to have on culture that's really what what's what's the deep under Tomorrowland and in the 20 years that have sort of passed between Andy Newberg decoding, you know, oneness with everything and where we are today, pretty much every mystical experience you can think of has been decoded. There are mysteries still. Um, and this does not answer any of the big questions. This does not tell us if there's a God or not. All mm -hmm. it tells us is that so-called spiritual experiences or mystical experiences are mediated by biology. Mm -hmm. It just explo exposes the mechanism. But at this point, we understand what knobs and levers are being tweaked in the brain during these experiences. This is going to have a radical impact on religion. This, you know, the, the goal of religion is to get you close to God. Well, we now know what knobs and levers in the brain to tweak <laughs> to produce that experience. Yeah. So we can judge the effectiveness of your faith structure against the effectiveness of my faith structure by actual measurable data for the first time in history. I mean, I was almost surprised to see you cover psychedelics in in Tomorrowland. Why? I mean, why why did you I mean, you, you touched on so it so a second ago. To, again, you have to go back to flow, which is what I've been researching for two decades now at the center of a lot of my research. Right. And flow is bracketed neurobiologically by a bunch of things. Psychedelics are right next door because the same systems that produce psychedelic experiences tend to produce flow states. So we talked about transient hypofrontality. The self goes away. There's a couple different ways this can happen. One way it can happen is you put all of your attention into the present moment. You really focus. Psychedelics do that by giving you so much information at once, they overload the conscious mind with data. The subconscious has to take over. Same process underneath. And the other thing is with psychedelics, the research into psychedelics has been accelerating exponentially again because this is uh, you know this is a biotechnology on a certain level and what we're learning about about these substances is fantastic and their you know their healing potential is incredible and you know let's just take you know a very intractable difficult condition like post-traumatic stress disorder mm, yeah <clears throat> Okay, and let me let and, I, and we'll, we'll I'll, I'll give you all the reasons. Uh, we'll we'll talk about flow, and we'll talk about psychedelics, and we'll talk about regular medicine. So right now, it's an intractable condition. There are only a couple of drugs approved to treat PTSD, and they're basically SSRIs. And the data on their effectiveness is well, they're they're not effective at all. A very 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 small percentage of the population can actually you know get relief from PTSD uh, with with that. So. A doctor by the name of Michael Mitherhofer down in, in, in South Carolina did some research with MDMA, ecstasy, the street drug ecstasy, MDMA, which is basically serotonin. It's one of the chemicals that shows up in flow on PTSD. And what they found, and they, they looked at victims of childhood trauma, victims of childhood sexual abuse, so physical and sexual abuse, and they also looked at soldiers, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans, all of whom had PTSD. What they're finding is 
one to three sessions of psychedelic therapy and talk therapy. So they're given MDMA and they're given a very long kind of eight hour talk therapy protocol. It's a very complicated protocol, but as little as three sessions, as well as little as one, but three sessions is, is, is what's average, uh, can produce total relief from PTSD systems or a significant decline. And the study has been running about four years now. And so for four years, total remission. And it literally, you know, I talked to several of the soldiers who took part in the study, and they literally said it was overnight. They had PTSD, they took MDMA, they didn't have PTSD. Wow. So interestingly, like, let's do some comparisons. They redid that study with flow with soldiers at Camp Pendleton. They took them surfing, which is a very high flow activity, and they used talk therapy, and they got the exact same results. Remember, regular medicines don't work at all. MDMA could do it in one to three sessions. They found that five weeks of surfing and talk therapy produced a total or significant reduction in PTSD symptoms. They then redid that with meditation, mindfulness meditation. I think it was a, it was a half hour a day. They got similar results, but you need 12 weeks of meditation. So when I said earlier, right, psychedelics flow and Mindfulness, and meditation. meditation. It's the same thing. These three studies are a really clear example of those things. It's also a clear example of, hey, this is an intractable psychological problem, and yet you're getting nearly overnight massive results from these altered states of consciousness, these ecstatic states. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Wow, that's so powerful. I mean, I was so, so glad to, I mean, it's so refreshing to see, you know, someone of your caliber covering this, it's because I feel like there's such a, a social stigma uh, around these compounds because people use them irresponsibly. And I mean, it, thankfully we have organizations like MAPS and, you know, we throw, we throw our military veterans kind of under the bus. They come back with PTSD. The medications we give them, give them don't work. The treatments we have don't work. So, I mean, it's well, life changing. Have, but but the, the flip side is, and I, you know, my next book covers this, but we're really in the middle of what could be called an ecstatic revolution. With more and more people, altered states of consciousness, they, they not only can they heal trauma, but they give us access to a lot of things that levels of creativity, inspiration, intuition, information that we couldn't access under normal times. And this is flow, this is psychedelics, this is meditation, and you know, take your pick however you get into these states. There's lots of different ways in, but the results are things we're bad at and really need, cooperation, collaboration, creativity. And what we're seeing really is an underground revolution, and it's not so underground anymore. I mean. Tim Ferriss, for example, has basically pulled his money out of venture capital and he's using it all to fund psychedelic research. He just he just crowdfunded along with a number of other very, 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 very big Silicon Valley notables, uh, $91,000 for a research study into psychedelic mushrooms, psilocybin, as a cure for depression that's being run at Johns Hopkins. So... You right. So there's, it, you know, and there's. I mean, when was it? It was 2015 when Rolling Stone wrote an article about microdosing with psychedelics as the new business tool in Silicon Valley. And one thing I will tell you, and this is, you know, my one of the places my new book emerged. I kid you not, is we started out talking about how business 20 years ago had no interest in passion, purpose, creativity, those kinds of things. So. You could imagine my surprise when, you know, in 2013, after Rise of Superman comes out, I'm, you know, I'm talking flow with everybody from Google to the Navy SEALs to Fortune 100 companies to Wall Street brokers and, you know, to high tech companies. Take your pick. It's all over the place. And I'm literally standing on a stage or leading a workshop teaching people how to use an altered state of consciousness. <laughs> and it's everywhere in the business world. And that alone to me was, you know, so far on the no longer down the no longer in Kansas scale. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was yeah. mind blowing to me. It's proof. But, yeah. but the funny thing was after these workshops, after I got off stage, people were coming up to me, every one of these places saying, 
Yeah, but uh, my whole team is microdosing on a regular basis. Or on <laughs> weekends, we're going to tantric sex workshops. Or everybody's <laughs> going skydiving together. And we're all at Burning Man. And it's like we were talking about one altered state of consciousness. And we thought this was the most radical thing in the freaking world. And everywhere I turned, people were coming up to me and saying, oh, no, we're sampling from the entire ecstatic menu right now. <laughs> because it's giving us something that we fundamentally need to do our jobs. And we can't get any place else. And that was that was mind blowing. I really I've come to, you know, the, the new book is called Stealing Fire. And the subtitle is The Secret Revolution in Human Performance. And I really have come to believe it's revolution. It's a, at a revolutionary level. And let me just to kind of put some hard data around this and really blow your mind. Sure. So we decided, so we decided, when we talk about these experiences, the word we like to use is, is a Greek word called ecstasis. It's the root of the word ecstasy, and it literally means to step outside oneself, to get outside one's normal state of consciousness, to get outside your head, right? And it, what it neurobiologically describes is the very same kind of knobs and levers I talked about earlier, right? Like the things that we talked about happening in the brain, that happens during ecstasis. That's how we stand outside ourselves. So uh, my partner, Jamie Will, and myself and, and, and a team of researchers spent about six, six months trying to put some numbers around what we call the altered states economy, which is how much money people spend trying to get out of their heads, trying to get into these spaces. And we didn't mean intentionally, sure there's a lot of intentionality going on, but a lot of people are doing it accidentally or haphazardly or they don't know what they're doing. But with these knobs and levers of the brain underneath, you could actually just say, hey, we're looking for these, you know, these fundamental neurobiological changes and if experience produces it and people are seeking it out, we can credibly to keep included in our tally. Right. Also, we were as unbelievably conservative as possible. So let me give you an example. You could say that pretty much any time anybody goes to see live music, they're going for a state shift experience. Either they want communitas, that giant group flow experience where the, they become one with the crowd and the music takes them away, or they're using drugs, or you know, take your pick. We said, okay, well, that's ridiculous. People go to see live music for lots of other reasons beyond state shift. So we narrowed it down to only electronic dance music. Why? Because, well, you're not going to the music to listen to the lyrics. There aren't any. You're not going to see the band because the DJ just pushed play. There's nothing to look at. You're literally just going to dance your brains out, sometimes drug your brains out, and get swept away by the music. There's no other reason to go to the experience. So we took very limited numbers, mm -hmm. right? When we added it all together, and these are as conservative as we possibly could be, we found it was $4 trillion. That is wow. about one seventeenth of the global economy. It is more than the GDP of India. It is more than the GDP of Russia. It is essentially the GDP of Germany. And that is how much money we spend chasing these altered states, chasing ecstasis, chasing the ability to shut off ourself. What's interesting and what I think Tomorrowland kind of starts to get at and what my new book, Stealing Fire, will definitely get at is that because biotechnology is accelerating at five times the speed of Moore's law and we now have decoded all these experiences, we are getting better and better and better at chasing them. And which is a good thing because historically, Every time we've sort of tried to chase down these experiences at a big level, things have gone horribly wrong. This is like we've gotten it wrong almost every time, you know, we tried. Ken Kesey sticks, sneaks LSD out of a Stanford research lab and all kinds of tie-dyed hell breaks loose. <laughs> Sexual revolution of the 1970s, right? We're chasing, you know, ex Sexual experience is a tool for ecstatic liberation, and what do we get? Highest rates of marital dissatisfaction and divorce in the history of the universe. Wow. Rave culture of the 1990s starts off as peace, love, unity, and technology, and ends up with you know spiking emergency room visits and tabloid father. It does <laughs> not go well for us historically when we chase these things down, but what we're seeing now is sort of a middle path emerging, one that's sort of, we can rule out all the previous superstitions of the past gatekeepers, right? We no longer have to listen to Tim Leary and demagogues like that telling us to go in a certain <laughs> way. We can do the research for ourselves. And in fact, there are open source lexicons 
citizen science, I mean, we do it at the Flow Genome Project. We're an open source citizen science project into flow, into ultimate human performance. But you can DMT, there's the DMT Nexus or Arawad. These are open source psychedelic lexicons. And we're seeing this, there's a near death experience and an out of body experience. Like these are open source lexicons into altered states of consciousness. So these are people describing their experiences. How do they make me feel? Think about like, you go back a couple thousand years and religion is some guy saying, hey, I went up on the mountaintop and uh, I had this mystical experience and I was given these these tablets, but I seem to have lost them or broke them. So you're going to have to take my word for it. And that's <laughs> really like how it's gone since the beginning of time. Now we've got these giant open source lexicons where like you go up on the mountain, you have your mystical experience, you come back down and you have to compare it and validate it against the reports of hundreds of thousands of other people who have also had this experience. So your one truth is now you have to take a big data approach to this stuff yeah. for the first time in history, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And we've covered so much, Stephen. I mean, it, as a sort of wrap up sort of question, I, I usually like to ask, you've written a bunch of books that have become pretty successful. And is, is there anything out there that you would kind of tell a budding writer or someone that maybe looks up to you, is following your path? I mean, is there anything that you would kind of a message that you would send out to the, that person? There's a bunch of different messages to send out to that person. I, you know, I, I, so one thing that I, that I think is, is, that has worked for me and I think works for a lot of other people, I'm a big believer in getting small. I think if you're really interested in success, you reduce your life to a handful of fundamental things and you do those things. I noticed in my own life and I noticed in a lot of other people's lives um, that the really successful, what people end up figuring out is the things they fail at are usually the things they give up at. On. Mm. And it's because they're trying to do too many things at once. And that's a very, you know, it's, it's very hard to fight against that tendency. Um, but I'm a big believer that you reduce, you know, your life. I reduce my life to six fundamental things. And I do those six things. And if you don't fall on that list, I don't do it. It's an instant no. I, you know, it's, mm. it's just a filter. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple, Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Music